Hello friends, this is Dr. Vishal from Team MSD and today we will be discussing about the orthopedic related questions that are being asked in the recently held initiate examination. So without wasting time, we will move on to the questions. So the first question which has to be recalled is identify the type of brace given in the following image. So the options were Milwaukee brace, Ashi brace, Taylor's brace and Boston brace. So the correct answer is Milwaukee brace. It's also called as CTLSO. Right from the cervical spine to the sacral spine, the brace will stabilize everything. So it consists of two parts. The first one we can see, it's like a oval to hold the neck. And the last one below one here is the pelvic part. So these two posterior and anterior horn will hold the dorsal and the lumbar spine. This is one in case of a scoliosis patient, now it's not being used. The other options that are given in the questions are the Boston brace, which is nothing but exactly similar to the Milwaukee brace. But the only difference is this neck collar will not be present here. That is Boston's brace. It is too worn for scoliosis patients. And the other option is ash brace. As we can see in the picture, it is worn anteriorly. It, if it is used anteriorly, it will push the body posteriorly. So it causes hyperextension. In case of kyphosis, where there will be progressive anterior bending of the thoracic spine, this brace can be used. And the last option is the tailless brace. You can compare this to school back. It will be having a two collars around the shoulder. It is worn in case of a fracture of the thoraco lumbar vertebra. So the second question is, in spinal surgery, the screws are fixed at option A, pedicle, option B, spinous process, option C, lamina, and the fourth option is the facet joint. If you know the anatomy of spine, then this one is a very easy one because pedicle will be the right answer. So let's discuss the anatomy of vertebra. This is the cross section of a vertebra looking from the superior view. This is the vertebral body, everyone knows, and this is the spinous process. In case of any fracture of the spine, this vertebral body will be the one which is going to be affected. So we have to stabilize this part. If you put a screw in the spinous process, this has no connection with the body. So this option can be ruled out safely. And the second one is the facet joint. A joint, a facet joint is one which communicates with the vertebra above and the vertebra below. So option two. The facet joint is also ruled out. So the third option is the lamina and the pedicle. So a pedicle is the part which connects the vertebral body to the transverse process. So this one is the pedicle. So when you insert a screw from the posterior surface through the pedicle to the vertebral body, this vertebral body can be prevented from collapse. So these are the pedicle screws. And uh, this is the lateral view, this is the body, this is the transverse process and the part which is connecting the transverse process to the vertebral body is the pedicle. So the correct option is pedicle screw. So third one, the drugs promoting bone formation. Okay. For a bone to be formed, there are two types of cells, osteoblast and osteoclast. So osteoblast B. It builds. Osteoclast C, it cuts. So, the only hormone, periparatite, which is an analog of parathormone, is acting on the osteoblast that is responsible for bone formation. All the four drugs used here are, can be used in osteoporosis, but the remaining three drugs action are opposite of that, which means normally osteoblast will build and osteoclast will cause resorption. Either by building it or by preventing the resorption, the bone strength can be maintained. So, raloxifen, calcitonin and bisphosphonates are three drugs which indirectly act by preventing the action of osteoclast, thereby preventing osteoporosis. So, the answer is teriparatite, which is an analog of parathormone, which acts on the osteoblast and it causes bone formation. So the next question is tests which are not commonly done in osteoporosis. So 
Just remember the clinical point of view. An osteoporosis patient will be old and aged women or female who after sustained menopause will come to you with back pain. So whenever a patient is coming to you with back pain, the first investigation that you order will be an x-ray. So this option can be safely ruled out. The next one what we perform in case of an osteoporosis or an old woman is the serum, calcium and phosphorus levels. So chemical analysis can also be ruled out. And the third one, from the question we can observe some key points. For osteoporosis, DEXA scan is the most commonly and most acceptable investigation. So what this DEXA scan is, dual energy x-ray absorptiometry. So the patient will be positioned in this manner and x-ray beam will be focused at the pelvis and the lumbosacral bones because that is the area most commonly affected by osteoporosis. It consists of two rays, one for the tissues and another one for the bones. They will subtract the tissues of the soft tissues and the bone and the difference is calculated as bone mineral density. That bone mineral density will be compared to a same individual of the normal child. So the deviation, if it's more than two, then the patient will be labeled as osteoporosis. So the option is we can rule out chemical analysis, X-ray and DEXA scan. So the option is B, D and C. Bone scan and quantitative CT, we don't do it more often for osteoporosis patient as it is more costlier. So the next one, a 10 year old boy presenting to you with pain around the knee, the lesion involved is the situs distal end of femur. So what is the probable diagnosis? So whenever you receive an image like this showing a cut section of a bone with a rapid growth, remember in general it's going to be a malignant tumor. So for that you should know what are the benign tumors and what are the malignant tumors. So from the question we can identify giant cell tumor is a benign tumor, osteodastioma is also a benign tumor, chondroblastoma is also a benign tumor. So the only option that is left is osteosarcoma and which is going to be the answer. And whenever the age group is present as pediatric with a distal femur, the option has to be osteosarcoma. So the X-ray wise features of osteosarcoma are the sundry appearance where due to peri osteal reaction, the bone, form, the bone forming will be more compared to the periosteum. So this is the sunburst appearance. So the other tumor that has to be discussed are the giant cell tumor. The lesion will be most common around the epiphysis, but just remember the radial borders, the cortical breach will not be seen in giant cell tumor. And it is named giant cell because in histology, these cells resemble a giant cells. Next one for osteoosteoma, the question will have a clue like there is night pain which is relieved by taking medications or aspirin. In x-ray, we can see a nidus. The nidus will be small. If the nidus is large, then it's going to be osteoblastoma. So the next question is 40 year male with back stiffness and unable to look straight. So the options are rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, righteous disease and fluorosis. So rheumatoid arthritis, the question will have clues like early morning stiffness and involvement of small joints like the PAP joints and the DAP joints. So for ankylosing spondylitis, the question will have clues like decreased chest expansion, respiratory difficulties, inability to look straight. Why that? Because in ankylosing spondylitis, all the bones of the vertebra will be fused. The ankylosing spondylitis will involve the axial bones which means the spine and the hip bones while the rheumatoid arthritis will involve, in, will involve the periphery bones especially the small bones of the hands. Writer's disease the question will have triad clue like conjunctivitis, urethritis and arthritis. Fluorosis is an endemic situated pro, uh, disease uh, which is not general, generally discussed. So this is the CT film of the ankylosing spondylitis where we can see the anterior end plates are all fused which is the dagger sign. It is seen in lateral view. Next one. While performing a case of non-union fracture shaft of femur 
which is the substance added for osteo induction so the question is the bone femur which is fractured has not united so that means the individual lacks the bone forming potential so in that case we are going to supplement something which is going to ignite the formation of bone so bone morphogenic proteins as the name suggests they are osteo inductive properties which are responsible for bone formation the next option is pmma which is nothing but polymethyl methacrylate which is an exact replica of bone that is also called as a bone cement which is a replacement for a bone in case of a lost bone it can be kept but it has no osteo inductive property the next one are all the contents of a bone which is calcium gluconate and phosphate and they don't have any osteo inductive properties so the answer is bone morphogenic proteins they belong to a subgroup of family called tumor growth factors and they are responsible for osteo induction the next one inability to absorb the shoulder joint due to paralysis of which nerve root so there are two things we should learn one is the myotome and another one is the dermatome so c5 c6 c7 c8 were the options given so for shoulder joint to be able to abduct you need the action of deltoid which is supplied by c5 so the answer is going to be c5 so the myotome is c5 so what are the other myotomes that you should remember just if you are going to take something from the sideways and you are going to give it to the audience so c5 the myotome is shoulder abduction for c6 it's elbow flexion for c7 the opposite is elbow extension and for c8 it's going to be wrist flexion and for t1 it's going to be finger abduction once again i'll tell you for c5 it's shoulder abduction for c6 elbow flexion for c7 elbow extension for c8 wrist flexion and for t1 finger abduction so these are the myotomes we should remember and the dermatomes in the hand we should remember three dermatomes what are the three dermatomes are c8 c7 and t1 so c7 c8 and t1 just in the fingers just keep the odd fingers which means you have to keep your thumb and middle finger and the ring last finger so just turn the other two fingers now this one will be your c7 the middle finger will be your c8 and last finger will be your t1 so in this way we can remember the sensory dermatomal distribution so radio ulna joint is a type of this question is actually a mixed question because radio ulna joint it's of three types proximal middle and distal proximally and distally the ulnar joint will pivot around the radius if you can see in the forearm when you move the middle part will be stable but the proximal and lateral part will be the one that is rotating so this is a type of joint which occurs only in a fibrous joint the middle radio ulnar joint next one for synovial joint uh, it has to be a large joint with more fluid like a knee joint so the ball and socket joint is one where for example you can take a shoulder or hip where there will be a ball and it is placed in a socket a syndesmotic joint is also a type of fibrotic joint but there the connection is between the cartilage so some kind of movement occur unlike middle radial ulnar joint where it is a fibrous one and strictly there is no movement taking place the next one is muscle which is not used in overhead abduction so we have to know the muscles which are used in abduction so for the initial 15 degrees supraspinatus is used for 15 to 90 degrees deltoid muscle is used and for overhead abduction trapezius and serratus anterior is used pectoralis major is the option which has to be ruled out for overhead abduction thank you